One of the hardest struggles that Naruto faced growing up was his alienation from the village. He was neglected, and that sucks. Most of this was actually due to Kurama, the Nine Tails. Despite everything, Kurama ended up becoming Naruto's closest friend. Naruto had no one to relate to, nobody to understand, and one of my favorite topics to make stories about revolves around that concept. Naruto always sought for someone to understand him, and nobody ever did, which made him very effective at understanding others who felt like no one could understand them. If you want to know the true power of this, look to none other than Gara. That boy was a genocide route frisk with a love stat of 20, and Naruto just I feel your pained his way into turning Gara into a flower gardener with a level head. I mean, can Gara even be called Gara anymore? He's like a totally different person, but I'm getting off track. Naruto never had companionship, nor did he ever really feel loved as he had no one to share his life experiences with. Well, now I want to change that. I want to tell a story where Naruto isn't alone. A story where Naruto was a part of a very special unit. Welcome to the Amagi. Before we begin, we publish a new video every day, so be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. We've noticed that a lot of people who are watching our videos aren't actually subscribed to the channel. We know that YouTube does a pretty good job at recommending you the stuff you want to watch, but if you don't want to miss any of our videos, and if you want to support the Amagi, we would really appreciate it if you subscribed. The Amagi's reach stretches beyond just this channel, so if you're a fan of us, please consider subscribing to our other channels and following us on all of our social media. Help us reach our goal of passing 100,000 followers on all of our accounts by the end of the year. Thanks so much. There were cries of terror as the Ninetales wreaked havoc upon the village. It was large, powerful, and its cries echoed across the plains like an ancient curse on the souls of those who had heard it. The people were terrified, but the village was prepared for just such an occasion. The better tamed Two Tails and Three Tails were also in the village, and their Jinchuriki knew what they were doing. The massive flaming cat of the Two Tails stood there majestically, like a guardian spirit, as the mollusk Isobu stood there, one eye closed like Popeye the Sailor Man. We can't let it harm the village, one of the Jinchuriki shouted. We need to stop it from launching its tailed beast ball. Matatabi rushed forward to engage Kurama directly, being far more nimble than the slow yet durable Isobu, who was also inching closer, putting itself between the village and the Ninetales in hopes of taking the brunt of any attack that the angered Kurama could launch. Kurama looked to Matatabi and Isobu and with a deep, booming voice, chastised them. You would willingly serve these humans like slaves, like pets? You've lost your pride. Matatabi would slide under and claw at Kurama, pushing him back and out of the village. Once he was at a safe distance, Isobu would charge up a tailed beast ball and fire it at the massive fox, striking it and knocking it back. Matatabi would stand there and watch to see if Kurama had been defeated, but to their horror, Kurama was still up. It was true, he was by far the strongest of the nine beasts. His power towered over theirs. Despite the numbers being on Isobu and Matatabi's side, they felt outnumbered. Kurama, now angered, increased his assault on his fellow beasts and in the end defeated these Chinchuriki and killed them. It seemed that none could save the village. But just as all hope seemed lost, a glowing light appeared. A yellow flash, making the decision to take the beast away, eventually to sacrifice himself. And because of his efforts, and the sacrifice of the two Jinchuriki who fought to save Konoha, the Ninetales was imprisoned once more, this time within a young child. Enter Naruto Uzumaki, a young boy with his whole life ahead of him. He's gutsy and sometimes very rude, but he has a good heart. As he makes his way to the academy, he enters and talks kindly with Iruka, who points him in the direction of a special room. Naruto enters to see his teammates there, Sakura Harano and Sasuke Uchiha. Sasuke was the son of the head of the Uchiha, Fugaku Uchiha. And currently, Sasuke was the Jinchuriki of Matatabi. Sakura would also wave to him. Being the Jinchuriki of Isobu, she was very unsuspecting. But this only made sense as, despite Isobu's rough appearance, he was actually a very sensitive creature, prone to crying when sad things happened, and was always popular with girls due to his sensitive side that he wasn't afraid to show. Now, to explain to you how this little team formed, I've got to explain to you how each member gained their tailed beast. It's no secret that Naruto has had his beast since birth. He wasn't originally chosen for the role, but he was the only one present to house the beast during the attack 12 years earlier. 
However, due to the cruelty of the situation, the cruelty of what would happen to the child should they take it away, and a powerful respect for his parents, who just so happened to be the fourth Hokage and the previous Jinchuriki of Kurama, they elected to let it stay with him. For a while though, the leaf was weakened due to the now unruly nature of the Ninetales as well as the deaths of the Jinchuriki of both Isobu and Matatabi. A little more lore for you to help build this world we're in. Matatabi and Isobu are actually spoils of war. Matatabi was captured from Kumo during the Third Shinobi World War, as was Isobu, who Rin Nohara had brought back with her one day after a mission that had gone horribly wrong, and then astoundingly well, especially considering that Isobu was now in their possession. Rin remained the Jinchuriki of Isobu until her death in the battle against the Ninetales. Isobu was originally quite hostile towards its Jinchuriki, but with some training and a lot of love, both Isobu and Matatabi ended up becoming very loyal to the village, falling in love with it and its people. Sadly though, after their destruction during the Ninetales attack, Konoha's reputation as an undisputed and powerful nation was called into question, and fears that a new war would break out were within the hearts of everyone. The Uchiha were considered to blame for this when Hiruzen spoke honestly with them, informing them that the Ninetales possessed the Sharingan within its own eye, hinting that it was an Uchiha who was in control of it. Fugaku refuted these claims strongly, seeming to be almost offended by this, though Hiruzen masterfully dealt with the situation by informing him that what happened and what it looked like were two very different things, and even if the Uchiha were innocent, someone with a Sharingan was controlling it. Hiruzen decided, however, to give the Uchiha every opportunity to prove their loyalty to the village, to which Fugaku agreed. The Uchiha clan together managed to hunt down and recapture Matatabi. The beast seemed apprehensive about coming back due to the fact that it was killed in that village, but after some intense negotiations with the beast, negotiations that likely included a lot of Sharingan, it would eventually return home. Isobu was a bit of a different story. With the death of Rin Nohara, he fell into a state of depression, having come to truly love this girl. He was asked by the Uchiha if he did not know that he would easily outlive her. Compared to a tailed beast, the life of a human is like the blink of an eye, no pun intended on the Uchiha part. Isobu stated that he knew it was so, and that he knew inevitably his heart would be broken, but he just didn't expect it to happen so soon. He wasn't ready for it. Isobu proved a little harder to convince to come back not due to apprehension, but due to a broken heart. When he did eventually get back to the village, he sulked quite a bit, tending to stay in the forest temple they had built for him to house him during the interim between Jinchuriki. Matatabi remained nearby to try and cheer him up, but Isobu just seemed lost and empty without Rin, something that only Kakashi could truly understand. Now, enter Sasuke Uchiha. Sasuke was a happy young boy, the second son of Fugaku Uchiha. Fugaku's first son, Itachi, was his pride and joy, being admitted into the Anbu even before the legal age, which Fugaku took pride in. He believed that the time of the Uchiha had finally come, and that it would be Itachi who would eventually inherit the title of Hokage. It was due to this pride that Fugaku seemed to neglect poor Sasuke a little. It wasn't that he never had anything to do with Sasuke, nor was it that he wasn't proud of him. Fugaku was just so busy and so proud of Itachi that he never truly acknowledged Sasuke. Again, it wasn't because Fugaku didn't love him, it was just the way things were, and Sasuke knew that, but it didn't change the fact that it made him sad. Itachi saw this, and it was actually his idea that Sasuke become the next Jinchuriki of Matatabi. You see, Sasuke had always loved cats, and cats liked him too. Itachi remembered making a paw print encyclopedia once, where they would travel about, taking the paw prints from various cats. Their journey even took them to Matatabi's lair, where the tailed beast was oh so happy to provide a paw print for Sasuke. Itachi remembered seeing Sasuke's face the moment he encountered Matatabi the first time. His eyes lit up and his smile drew across his face from ear to ear. Matatabi would also offer a glowing smile to the boy, pleased with his interest in her. She almost seemed at that moment to choose him, making an off-handed remark about it. What she had actually said about Sasuke, Itachi couldn't remember, but he knew that it was what she had said that had brought him to consider petitioning to make Sasuke the new Jinchuriki of Matatabi. It seems it worked out pretty well, because when Fugaku was presented with the opportunity, he was very glad. His pride in Sasuke increased exponentially. Then, when Fugaku asked Sasuke what his thoughts on it were, Sasuke seemed so happy to be the Jinchuriki of Matatabi that he started to cry. And the rest is history. Now, Isobu was the last of the tailed beasts to be sealed. He continued to be sad for most of the time, and when Matatabi was sealed into Sasuke, Isobu's mood seemed to grow even darker. 
Konoha began to scramble and search for a suitable kunoichi to be his jinchuriki. So many girls signed up for this because so many girls couldn't help but love the gentle giant. But none of them ever had their hearts ache for him, not like Sakura. The village would interview girls and give them personality tests. It seemed that the only person who was ever on Isobu's mind was Rin, and they knew that to pull him out of his funk, they would need to find the proper kunoichi. Sakura was not chosen to be his jinchuriki. They sent her back to her parents, telling her that her interest was appreciated by the village, but that her assistance was no longer required. This didn't really stop Sakura, though. She began to develop a habit of waiting for her parents to go to sleep before sneaking out of the house and into the containment area where Isobu was stored. Isobu at first seemed startled by her appearance, his reaction not too dissimilar from an elephant seeing a mouse. To any logical mind, one would not see Sakura as threatening to Isobu, but as said before, he was a sensitive and gentle giant who built up a shell around not only his body, but also his heart because he was so weak inside. Sakura would calm him down and would just spend time with him. Eventually, he grew to expect her presence, and on the one night after she failed to visit him, he was sure to tell her how lonely he felt. She would apologize and the two would talk endlessly about things. She would listen as he would tell stories about Rin Nohara and how they met, how he originally felt being her Jinchuriki and how they grew close together. But then he began to explain how ripped apart he was at her demise. He told Sakura that Rin's death hurt him far worse than his own and he would have been willing to die a thousand times just so Rin could be alive. To a point, he held a grudge against Kurama for taking her away from him. Sakura would lovingly stroke Isobu's face and kiss his cheek and tell him that it was okay, and that he would find someone new eventually. Not to replace Rin, because nobody could, but to find a new person who could love him like she did, and perhaps to help fill the hole in his heart left behind. Isobu felt safe when she was nearby. But as time came and went, a new Jinchuriki for Isobu was chosen, and Sakura came to Isobu to say goodbye. He asked why he couldn't see her anymore, and she had told him that it was because they had already chosen a new Jinchuriki for him, and that it wasn't her. Isobu seemed disappointed by this, seemingly trying to bargain his way out of it to Sakura, who admitted that she had no power over the choice. She told him that despite not having been chosen, she would always love Isobu and would be sure to befriend his Jinchuriki just so they could continue being friends. Isobu had not been as sad as he was that night in a long time, so much so that he couldn't sleep. He agonized, feeling his heart rip open. No matter how he looked at it, how he tried to explain to himself that it would be okay, he couldn't bring himself to be pleased. Instead, his heart just hurt. It killed him to know that it was not in his control. The day after, the sealing team would arrive with the new Jinchuriki in tow. They would bid Isobu a good morning and introduce him to his new Jinchuriki, who had been chosen for him via personality test. This Jinchuriki not only possessed the same personality type as Rin Nohara, but was also considered to be a 100% match for Isobu. Despite this, he shunned the girl, much to their confusion. He refused to be sealed inside of her, despite their attempts to make him feel more comfortable about it. Isobu would inform them that he would not go into this new girl because he wanted someone else. They were surprised to hear that he had someone else in mind. Isobu flat out demanded to be sealed at the Sakura Harano, saying he liked her best. Due to this, Isobu's sealing was held off as they brought Sakura back in for consideration. She was sleeping in until noon, as she often did due to the long nights she spent with Isobu. As soon as she opened the door and saw Konoha Nin asking for her, she immediately thought that she was going to be thrown in jail. Indeed, they mentioned that they knew she was sneaking into the habitat at night, but they weren't pressing charges. Instead, they asked her if she would be willing to be Isobu's new Jinchuriki, as he would have no other. Sakura, knowing that this was such an Isobu thing to do, agreed happily, and was then brought before Isobu alongside the sealing team. She walked to him and extended her arms and gave Isobu a hug to inform him of the good news. And for the first time in a while, Isobu stepped out of his temple and into the sun with a smile on his face. The team prepared the ritual, which was quick and painless for both parties, and that was how Isobu and Sakura met. It was after this that both Sasuke and Sakura would be brought in. Sakura had seen Sasuke in the academy and had always had a crush on him. It was explained to Sakura that Sasuke was Matatabi's Jinchuriki, and Sasuke came to learn that Sakura was Isobu's. They were then informed that there was a third Jinchuriki in the village, and that they were planning to put the two of them together with him to form a special squad named in honor of the late Hokage's former team, of which Rin Nohara had been a member. The squad would be Team 7, but would also be known as Beast Squad, a name that Sasuke made no little effort to hide his liking of. 
the team would be told that they would officially assemble near the end of the final term before the test and eventual dispersion of students to teams. Now, as for Naruto, Hiruzen had come to Naruto personally and explained to him finally what he was and why he lived alone, helping him to learn that he was the Jinchuriki of the Nine Tails, which went a long way in explaining to Naruto why nobody really seemed to like him much. Hiruzen explained that they wanted to wait until the proper time to tell him so that he wouldn't accidentally nuke the entire village when he realized what he was, and what the thing inside of him had done and could do. To his credit, Naruto was very understanding, and was just happy to know why he wasn't a popular choice among the villagers. Hiruzen put the icing on the cake, however, by telling him that he was no longer the only Jinchuriki in the village, and that the other Jinchuriki had just been chosen for Matatabi and Isobu. When Naruto heard that it was Sasuke and Sakura, he was over the moon and couldn't wait to see them again. Hiruzen would tell him that they would meet soon and get ready for their team. And that's where they were now. They had finally met up. Naruto took a seat near the other two with a grin of excitement on his face at finally having some people that he could identify with. Sasuke and Sakura would chat it up with Naruto, telling him how excited they were to work with him. It was then that Iruka walked in and congratulated them on being the next Beast Squad, stating that the last team to bear this name included Rin Nohara and Naruto's own mother, Kushina Uzumaki. To commemorate this, a special instructor with ties to both of these people had been chosen, an instructor who had been studying up on tailed beasts and sealing jutsu with the esteemed Sanin Jiraiya. Iruka introduced them to Kakashi Hatake of the Sharingan Eye. Kakashi was a perfect candidate for this job due to not only his level-headed nature, but also thanks to his Sharingan, with which he could cast a powerful genjutsu that would calm the tailed beasts. Kakashi would greet them in his naturally cool way, his voice betraying a laid-back manner. The team would also greet him. Due to the special situation that led to their formation, Team 7 graduated early from the academy to begin their training with Kakashi, who Iruka knew would help them even out any bumps in their training as they appeared. And that is what they did. Now, if you think that there's a bell test hidden somewhere in this training, well... You'd be right. Given how closely Beast Squad is holding to tradition, it's only natural to keep up this one as well. Now, the team at first have a hard time keeping up with this lesson, but Kakashi, not feeling the need to force his new squad to figure it out alone, would eventually explain to them exactly what the meaning of the test was about. He told them that the biggest thing required for a team to be functional was teamwork. He told them that this was why they should train together, talk together, and begin to learn more about each other. They needed to become a single unit. And so, even though they never got the bells that day, they began to learn more about the way the others think and act, which helped them to alter their own actions accordingly. They focused mostly on training and learning to use their tailed beasts. According to what Jiraiya said, focus should be enough, but when in doubt, yeet the kids off a cliff. A direct quote from the master himself. And so, that's what Kakashi did. He separated them and forced them all into a situation with real peril, or what felt like real peril. Something he knew they could survive if they pulled enough chakra from their tailed beasts. He knew that if he really let these kids die, he would have his head served to the council on a silver platter. Regardless, all kids awakened their powers due to terror as Jiraiya had told him they would, and they were really raw at him for doing this though, particularly Naruto and Sakura, who were by far the more emotionally unstable ones of the group. Unlike Sasuke, who was like, I see what you did there. Between bouts of training, they would go on missions, and yes, this includes the Land of Waves mission. You think I'd forget? This mission was specifically chosen for Team 7 as a way to test their power, capabilities, and potential. It wasn't designed to be too dangerous, but upon hearing that it would be free of charge, Tazuna explained to them the severity of the situation he was in, including hitmen and assassins. This would normally be well outside of a Genin's range, but Hiruzen assigned it to Team 7 anyway, and with their power, if they were progressing at the estimated rate, they should be able to handle this mission. Now, the progression of physical skill was something that they could estimate, but mental and emotional growth was a completely different can of beans. They knew that Naruto had the power, but could they know that he would freeze when faced with the Demon Brothers? Kakashi wasn't exactly surprised by this reaction. It was a normal one, but it made Kakashi wonder if they were truly ready for this mission. On the reverse, Sasuke handled it very well. Naruto's disappointment in himself was enough to spur him on further though, and helped him grow due to his desire not to be left behind. Now, when Zabuza showed up and Kakashi was captured, Naruto and Sasuke's teamwork, as well as their usage of their version 1 chakra cloaks, helped them push Zabuza back and defeat him. This was impressive to Kakashi, but what did he expect? These three were Jinchuriki. 
they would make it to the little fishing village known as the Land of Waves, where they would settle in with Hazuna and further train to control their beasts. On the day that they were to guard the bridge, once more Zabuza would attack, and this time he brought Haku with him. Haku, as usual, would manage to lock Naruto and Sasuke away in the demonic mirroring ice crystals technique, but this didn't have much effect on them as they were capable of utilizing their tailed beasts. The heat from their chakra was enough to melt the mirrors, but Sasuke would add this power to his ninjutsu, particularly his fire style, which would turn the ball of flame blue. Its heat was magnified and managed to not only break free from the ice crystals technique, but also practically made Naruto and Sasuke immune to all of Haku's attacks, save the non-ice related ones such as Senban. But even then, Sasuke's Sharingan could see the projectiles coming, and his natural agility mixed with that of his tailed beast had him moving like a true cat. Sasuke currently was the direct answer to Haku and his abilities, which meant Haku had very little chance of beating Sasuke. Due to no real emotional charge, Haku would not have to be killed, though it also meant he was subdued and unable to save Zabuza, which left Haku as the lone survivor. All alone, nowhere to go, Naruto, Sasuke, and Sakura felt their hearts hurt for him upon realizing that Zabuza was truly Haku's only friend. Naruto knew what it was like not to have friends, so upon asking Kakashi's approval, Naruto would ask Haku to come to Konoha where he would be treated with respect and well cared for. Haku seemed a little hesitant, but Naruto told him to consider this the last gift from Zabuza, a chance to start over somewhere new and be who Haku wanted to be. So the boy accepted it and together they defended the bridge from Gato's goons. When the bridge was completed, Gato's days as the Monopoly Man were numbered. Though he would try to cause issues, Kakashi would merely tell Hiruzen of what was happening in the Land of Waves, and Hiruzen would eventually send more shinobi to the little fishing village to clear out the thugs, which officially left the Land of Waves liberated. Kakashi would eventually inform Hiruzen of how well Beast Squad did both physically and emotionally, and Hiruzen would approve of them entering the Chunin exams. When asked if they would be willing to take the exams, each member excitedly agreed. Now, for the most part, the first test remains almost identical. After all, it's a test of guts and a test of intelligence and skill. It has nothing to do with brute force, so I don't see it changing. Sakura is still an egghead, Sasuke still has Sharingan, and Naruto still has... But he's gutsy, so even in the face of certain failure and irreparable harm to his career, he faces it anyway, something Ibiki Marino questioned whether it's an attribute of him being brave or him being stupid. I lean toward the latter. Now, when the second test comes around, that's when things start to change. Why don't we zoom in on our heroes here and see what they're up to? I really gotta pee though, Naruto exclaims as he does a little exaggerated dance. Sakura in anger shouts at him, a vein popping out of her forehead. Then why didn't you go in any of the time before the gate opened? Because I didn't have to go then! Sasuke sighed. You know we can't risk you going off on your own, right? My brother told me that the most dangerous time on a mission is when you sleep and when you use the bathroom particularly the latter, because you have your guard down and you're away from your friends. Naruto looked confused. So does that mean I can't pee? Sasuke sighed loudly. You can pee, but you gotta do it where we can see you. Naruto's eyes widened in horror. I can't do that. There's a girl here, and I have a shy bladder. Sasuke crossed his arms. It's either that or you hold it. Naruto looked at the bush and then at Sasuke. Fine, I'll just hold it. And so they continue through the forest, bearing only their heaven scroll. They carefully search for a target weaker than them so they may steal the earth scroll. It's then that they encounter Shiore. She's alone and that makes her an easy target. They approach her to take the scroll, but in the moment they do, her head turns a full 180 degrees and extends outward towards them like a snake. Sasuke and the rest of the beast squad enter a defensive stance ready to attack. Shiore attempts to freeze them with her, or should I say his, if you know what I mean, killing intent. This manages to be particularly effective on Sakura due to Isobu's weakness, and it's fairly effective on Sasuke too. However, it doesn't work on Naruto as planned. In fact, the stairs terror bounces back on Orochimaru after witnessing Naruto's eyes in his version 1 cloak. He realizes that there's something far scarier inside of Naruto than inside of himself, and this frees Sasuke and Sakura from their hold. Orochimaru had originally come here in search of Sasuke in hopes of taking his body. While there were plenty of Uchiha alive, he wanted the one with the most potential, and he determined that to be Sasuke. And now, he was on the receiving end of that potential as Sasuke, Naruto, and Sakura absolutely hammered him with their cloaks, enough to drive him off. They further took his Earth Scroll, which allowed them to pass the test and enter the arena. They would then be congratulated by Irika for a job well done. Irika would advise them to rest until the third round of the exams, as well as asking Naruto to change his pants. 
and this they would do until it was time for the exhibition matches. Now, for the first rounds, Team 7 does exceptionally well. I mean, after all, they're fighting lackluster Shinobi. Shinobi considered nowhere near the cream of the crop. Sakura absolutely stomps Ino with her tailed beast, going so far as to say it was an unfair advantage to allow her to use it. Sasuke actually doesn't use his tailed beast against his opponent, and Naruto is able to defeat Kiba with relatively no difficulty. But as the matches continue on, they're informed of a month off for training and rest. Kakashi takes them to the side and begins to train them to control their tailed beasts further. He stands before them, arms crossed, his book closed and in his hand. Given that he was not reading, this suggested that whatever he was going to tell them now was important. You may be able to control your tailed beasts now, but this is in no way your fullest potential. The chakra cloak you use now is only the first version, or the first stage as you would call it. Naruto, Sasuke, and Sakura seem surprised that they can access more of this chakra at will. Kakashi then comes clean about something. I have a confession to make. There's a reason why you're in the tuning exams, and it has very little to do with your success in the Land of Waves as I said before. In particular, it has to do with your status as Jinchuriki. When the Nine Tails escaped from Naruto's mother, it killed Isobu and Matatabi. That weakened us in the eyes of our enemies, and the world's been on a hair trigger ever since. We've barely avoided a fourth Shinobi World War on multiple occasions. The reason why you're in the tuning exams is to make a show of power. A public show of power that tells the villages nearby that we have our tailed beasts back and are capable of using them. The Third World War ended when Konoha gained access to these beasts. It weakened our enemies and gave us the power to strike and destroy any of the villages with little to no effort. Their deterrent was gone, and with that we achieved peace. But upon our loss of the two extra-tailed beasts, as well as the sealing of the nine tails into an infant, it was known that we had weakened. Suddenly, we weren't the big kid on the playground anymore, and the bullies were cropping up. It's important that we show off how strong we are by presenting three fully functioning Jinchuriki to tell the world, Baby, we're back. And that's why I'm going to teach you to deepen your well and achieve a greater power unable to be harnessed by any save a tailed beast user. And so he had them begin to meditate and speak to their tailed beasts. Sakura and Sasuke had very little issue with this. In fact, it seemed Sakura was just having a pleasant conversation with Isobu. Sasuke also reported no issues, stating that Matatabi's only reservation was fear that Sasuke wasn't ready and might accidentally hurt himself. Naruto, on the other hand, mentioned that his tailed beast just threatened to eat him. This caused Kakashi to treat Naruto's case with caution. He started by focusing on Sakura, asking her to awaken her version too. She would take a deep breath. Kakashi would instruct her that what she's doing is letting not only the beast force out more chakra, but also letting the beast partially form over her, using her body as its skeletal structure. He surmises that this form is only possible when a Jinchuriki manages to gain the trust of their tailed beast, which causes him to worry for Naruto. Sakura easily accomplishes this feat and enters her version 2 form without a hitch, even giggling inside of the form, saying it tickles and that she feels even closer with Isobu. Sasuke would then be instructed to do the same. Unlike Sakura, he displays a little bit of lag in his ability to achieve it, straining a little more each time he fails. Kakashi would tell him to try and not force anything and instead just ask Matatabi to trust him. Sasuke closes his eyes for a moment and suddenly he enters the form without even knowing that he had done so. He is enamored with this power and seeks so desperately to try and find out what he's capable of, but Matatabi chastises him and tells him that this form isn't a game and that he should try and take it seriously or people could get hurt. Kakashi turns to Naruto and asks him to try. It's obvious by the look on Naruto's face that he's unsure if he can truly do this. He activates his version 1 cloak and sits there, concentrating. His face twists a little into a grimace, which concerns Kakashi. Update Naruto. Naruto doesn't speak. Kakashi looks to the others who are still in their version 2 cloaks. He then looks back to Naruto. Naruto. Update. Naruto's eyes open to show fox slits. His mouth then pulls up into a sinister smile. Kakashi sees this and his eyes widen. Oh shit. Suddenly Naruto bursts into his version 2 cloak with enough force to knock Kakashi back off his feet. Naruto in his version 2 cloak now growls as he slowly steps toward Kakashi. Sasuke and Sakura step between Naruto and their master. Naruto, stop! Sasuke shouts from within his beast. A deep bass voice harmonizes with Naruto's voice and speaks. Naruto, Naruto can't, can't hear, hear you right, right now, now, slave. Sasuke suddenly feels a tension in his chest and can almost feel his version 2 cloak shiver beneath him. Sakura has started taking involuntary steps back. Sasuke looks to her. Sakura? She then calls out to him. Sasuke, I'm not doing this. Isobu's walking back all on his own. 
the aura around the Ninetales grows darker. Matatabi steps between Kakashi and Naruto, seemingly strengthened by the challenge. Isobu, however, completely steps out of the way and seems to choose submission over intervention. Sakura cries out, trying to get it to move, but the cloak tightens on her to stop her from moving. The Ninetales speaks. Isobu has grown wise since his death. It seems you've learned nothing, Matatabi. He rushes forward, headbutting Sasuke, sending him rolling. Sasuke is up almost immediately and goes to attack, but before he can, a tailed beast ball is fired at him. He just barely dodges it as the trees in the background erupt into flames. Sasuke rushes forward and pounces on Naruto, managing to hold him down. Sasuke has both of his hands around Naruto's throat. Matatabi speaks through the cloak. Give the boy back, Kurama. He's not your plaything. Kurama laughs. He's anything I deem him to be, just as you are. Suddenly, a second pair of hands reaches out from Kurama's sides and grips Sasuke and begins crushing and digging into the cloak. Sasuke cries out as Kurama begins to pierce through, his claws sinking deeper into Sasuke's flesh. Kurama overpowers Sasuke and ends up on top of him, forcing his strength harder until he breaks enough bones to cave Sasuke's chest in. At that, Sasuke stops fighting and Matatabi fades back inside of him. Kakashi sits up and sees that this is not good. To the side, Sakura is crying like a maniac for Isobu to do something, but he won't move. Kurama stands above Sasuke. And now, you die again. Next time, learn your lesson. He gets ready to claw him, but Kakashi activates his Mongekyo Sharingan. Kamui! And with that, Kurama's gone, teleported to another dimension. Kakashi rushes over to Sasuke to check his vitals. He's breathing, but just barely. It sounds like he's having a hard time, which, given the way his ribcage is collapsed on itself, suggests that his lungs may also be collapsed. It's a miracle he's even alive. It's at this time that Anbu Shinobi make their way in, having witnessed the tailed beast ball go off. They rush to Sasuke's side and begin attempting to stabilize him, at least long enough to be transported to the hospital. Kakashi then walks over to Sakura, who's just crying inside of Isobu, the beast still standing there. It looks up at Kakashi, who takes out a tag and places it on his head, causing the beast to disappear back into Sakura, who falls to her knees crying. I tried, Kakashi-sensei, she said. I tried. He wouldn't let me move. Kakashi puts his hand on her shoulder. It's okay. It was my fault. I pushed you all too soon. I just wanted you to make a big show at the exams. He looks back at Sasuke, who they're loading up on a stretcher. I guess that's all out the window now. She hugs her mentor. He's a little surprised by this, but he hugs her back. At the hospital, Sasuke is in the OR for many hours, the surgeon's trying to restore his broken ribcage. Due to the amount of internal damage done, he's put into a medically induced coma and on oxygen so his body can properly heal. All the while, Naruto is taken to a facility and caged. He remains in his version 2 form for quite some time while locked up. Eventually, getting so many members of the Nara clan, they set up many stage lights at proper angles so they can utilize their shadow paralysis jutsu to hold Naruto down. They have a hard time but manage to keep Naruto still while the Ninetales is suppressed. The form ends and Naruto, who was burned, his skin still attempting to heal from the damage, falls unconscious as well. All the while, Sakura is ignoring Isobu. But when she finally does decide to talk to him, she unloads, yelling at him for what he did to the point that she makes him cry. Even though he's crying, she doesn't stop. I was crying, she shouted at the beast. But you did nothing. You were going to let my friends die. How can I forgive that? How can I ever trust you again, she shouts. The beast turns away from her. I just didn't want you to die too. I didn't want to lose you like I lost Rin. Sakura sighs and rubs her temples. Isobu, this is the world we live in. I'm a shinobi. I'm in constant danger. There will always be the possibility that I'll die, and you need to know that. I can't have you slowing me down just because you're scared. Isobu stayed silent. Sakura turned to leave. Either obey my commands, or don't approach me to help again. She then left her subconscious and back into the real world. She stayed by Naruto and Sasuke the entire time. After some time, Sasuke manages to wake up, though he remains on oxygen. It's still too early to know if he'll have long-lasting lung damage. Naruto also wakes up, but he ignores the others and refuses to even look at them. Kakashi stands at the door, watching his team slowly fall apart. And it couldn't have come at a worse time, too. The Konoha Crush begins. Orochimaru's snakes begin to break through the village, and Gara's one tail begins to ravage the arena. In the ensuing fight, Hiruzen is killed, and Konoha is partially devastated before Orochimaru flees the village. The one tail disappears as quickly as it appeared and leaves Konoha to suffer. Konoha had hoped to take this chance to show off their new Jinchuriki, but instead, fate had taken them down another road. It had simply made Konoha seem weak, killing their Hokage. Further, with the death of Rasa, it would be assumed that this was due to an attack by Konoha, which in turn would result in mutual hatred between Suna and Konoha, 
which sowed the seedlings for war, one that could possibly reignite an old conflict with new ferocity, the Fourth Shinobi World War. Kakashi stood on the roof of the hospital where his squad was located. The rain was pouring from the skies as he looked out over the village. Smoke was still rising into the air from certain parts that had been devastated. The Hokage Rock had been defaced, the image of Hiruzen having been spitefully destroyed. Kakashi thought back on everything that had happened and couldn't help but feel responsible. It was he who had pushed his team too far. As their master, he should have known they weren't ready. He had not heeded the warnings from Jiraiya, and instead allowed the presence of the Chunin exams and the need to show the world that they were a force to be reckoned with left them all but defenseless. Their weakness was laid bare, their inability to protect themselves from other nations had been witnessed. An attack so small, led by a nation that had existed for barely a decade, had suddenly brought ruin upon what was supposed to be the most powerful village in all the world. They were a laughingstock, and now, the innocent would die with the rest of the shinobi world. Behind him, a voice spoke. You know it wasn't your fault, right? Kakashi turned his head, his eye witnessing Jiraiya out of the corner. Kakashi looked back. There was an eerie silence over the village. So much destruction, yet not a sound. Not even the birds nor insects that could normally be heard would dare lift their voice. Even when the sun was shining, there was no sound. It was as if life came to a screeching halt. I know. Then why are you being so hard on yourself? Jiraiya asked. You couldn't estimate when Orochimaru would have attacked us, and even if you hadn't attempted to train Naruto, Sasuke, and Sakura, they still would have likely ended up in the hospital in an attempt to defeat a full-tailed beast like the One Tail. At worst, they would be dead. None of this was your fault. It was an issue that's been boiling for over a decade. Kakashi sighed. You know, I'm not entirely sure. I think we could have stopped it. Maybe the Nine Tails wouldn't have heeded commands, but Isobu and Matatambi would have come to our aid without hesitation. If only I had used Kamui earlier before Sasuke got involved. Perhaps none of this would have ever happened. Jiraiya walked to the edge and looked down on the devastation. Perhaps. Perhaps you're right. Maybe it wouldn't have happened. But what could have been and what is changes nothing. We can agonize over the tiniest missteps in judgment and how they attributed to a cataclysm, or we can actively try to mend the issues in hopes of at least lessening the collateral damage. Kakashi looked to Jiraiya. What do you plan to do, Jiraiya-sensei? The old toad hermit looked over the village and toward the Hokage's monument and took a deep breath. I'm going to provide the people with hope. I've been tasked by the council to find a new Hokage, Tsunade in particular. She's strong, wise, intelligent, and she's got nerves at tungsten. If anyone can lead us through this mess, it's her. Kakashi bobbed his head in agreement. Jiraiya looked over. What about you? What will you do to solve this crisis? I don't know, Kakashi stated bluntly. Jiraiya turned his whole body to face Kakashi. I'll tell you what you're going to do. You're going to go back there and continue to teach your students. They're our village's deterrent. If war does come and we can't stop it, the only choice we'll have is ending it quickly. And that means we'll need the tailed beasts fully operational. Your mission is now and always has been the same. And it's more important than any other. It's your job to bring back Konoha's military might. Now get to it. There's no time left to waste. Jiraiya then disappeared, leaving Kakashi alone. Soaked to the bone, he turned around and slowly made his way back to the door from which he came. Stepping in, he made his way back down the stairs and into the hospital room. Sasuke was lying in bed, resting. His eyes were closed, and he now no longer possessed a ventilator. He was capable of breathing on his own. Sakura sat by his bedside, her head propped on the cushy mattress where Sasuke laid. Her somber expression was like a visual example of the village's entire mood as a whole. Hopeless, scared, sorrowful, and unsure of the future. Kakashi looked over at Naruto's bed and found it empty. Naruto's things having been packed up and taken. Where's Naruto? Kakashi asked. Sakura didn't even look to him. She spoke with a voice of near apathy. He left this morning. And where did he go? Sakura gave a slow, energyless shrug. He didn't say. I didn't ask. Kakashi stood there for a moment. Are you mad at him? She shook her head. No more angry than I am at myself. Kakashi gave a slow nod. It seems we're all feeling the weight of this, but I bet Naruto is feeling it worse than any of us. He probably blames himself for everything. Sakura looked up. Well, it is sort of his fault. Not that it's really something to be blamed for. He just got stuck with the strongest-tailed beast who just so happens to be an utter asshole. Kakashi couldn't disagree. Sakura's view of things, as pessimistic and potentially crude as it was, was true, no matter how blunt it actually was. Kakashi turned around to leave. Sakura's eyes raised to the back of her mentor's head. Where are you going, Sensei? 
Kakashi looked back at her for a second. I'm going to talk to Naruto. Kakashi walked through the streets. The raining had lightened into a weak mist. He made his way toward the home of Naruto Uzumaki. There was no indication that he had returned home except for the welcome mat, which had been moved. The underside of the mat had the impression of a key in it, signifying that Naruto had taken the key, likely having lost the original in the ensuing fight. He knocked on the door, but there was no answer. He turned the handle and felt the door give way, opening. Stepping inside, he saw that Naruto had not even bothered taking his shoes off at the door, instead tossing them to the side in the main living room. His backpack was also sitting in the middle of the room. He passed it by towards Naruto's bedroom and knocked on it. Go away, a voice said from within. You know I'm not going to do that, Naruto. Now let me in. There was silence for a few passing moments before Naruto's voice spoke. It's already unlocked. Kakashi pushed open the door and stepped in to see merely a lump under the covers of the boy's bed. Ah, catching up on your sleep. A good idea. You're gonna need all the rest you can possibly get for when we resume training. There was no response. Kakashi sighed and pulled up a seat. Maybe we should talk first. You know it's not your fault, right? If I had more control, I could have bent the Ninetales' will to my own. But I failed, and now Sasuke's hurt and people are dead. And now the world can go to war, and I can't stop it. Kakashi looked down. What would have been and what is changes nothing. We can agonize over how our tiniest missteps in judgment may have attributed to a cataclysm, or we can actively try and mend the issues in hopes of at least lessening the collateral damage. Naruto, you're our hope for the future, so stiffen that lip. You are the fulcrum to which the entire world is now balancing. What you do next matters. That's not helping any, Kakashi-sensei, Naruto stated. And in all honesty, Kakashi knew that it likely wouldn't. It would just place more pressure on Naruto to be perfect. But then again, Kakashi owed Naruto the truth. The reality was that this was the shinobi world. Your actions mattered, and sometimes you could only make a bad decision. Sometimes there was no right choice. Sometimes you had to choose between the lesser of two evils, and it's not always that those things were so clear, so cut and dry. Sometimes you messed up. These were things Kakashi had known all his life. His own father, Sakamo Harake, had made such a decision, and it had about as much impact on Konoha as this did. The event had led to Sakamo's ritual suicide, and now it felt like Naruto was feeling the same way. Kakashi hated that. He believed in honor just as much as the next guy, but killing yourself to win it back helped nobody. When you made a mistake, you had to work hard to rectify it. Maybe it wouldn't remove the stain from your name, but a dead man couldn't save the world, nor could he make up for the mistakes he made that put everyone in that position in the first place. Only someone still living and willing to make a difference could actually do that. Perhaps what I'm saying isn't helping you any, but it's not supposed to. What I'm saying isn't about you, Naruto. This is about the village, about the greater good, about the world in entirety. There are going to be children without parents, innocent villagers forced to fight in a war they don't believe in, and you have the ability and obligation to stop them. You don't have time to sulk. You've got to buck up, decide to fix your mistakes, and devote your existence to doing what you're supposed to do. Kakashi grabbed the covers and slowly pulled them off Naruto's face. And what if I mess that up too? Naruto asked, his face stained with tears, unable to even look Kakashi in the eyes. What if I fail? Kakashi leaned forward and put his hand on Naruto's shoulder. Then we do it together. We're Beast Squad. A single unit. If we fail, we fail. But until we fail, we're going to do our best to succeed. And if war comes, then we'll fight and give our all to limit the damage done, and save as many lives as possible, even if that means dying in the process. That's what it means to be a shinobi, Naruto. You're a shinobi, and so am I, and so are Sakura and Sasuke. We're all ninja and that means doing what is necessary for the greater good. But I'm going to tell you now, I believe in you. I believe you can complete your training and save the world, and we'll be here beside you, helping you along the way. Naruto would suddenly hug Kakashi. Startled by this, Kakashi pulled away, almost dragging Naruto out of the bed alongside him, but he gripped Naruto in a tight embrace and held him closely. Come, we have to help Sasuke and Sakura get their chins up too. Let's go. Together, they left for the hospital. By the time they returned, Sasuke had already awakened and was getting ready to be discharged. Itachi was already there, helping him get his clothes on correctly and not inside out and backwards as his groggy brain was trying. There you go. Now you look as professional and intimidating as ever. Sasuke gave a weak smile and coughed. He wheezed a little. Itachi rubbed his back. It's okay. You're okay. Sasuke returned to his full height. He walked with Itachi out of the room to the hall where Sakura was waiting. Naruto and Kakashi were on their way as they spoke. 
Sasuke and Naruto's eyes met for a moment. They just stood there, staring at each other. Naruto was the first to avert his eyes. I'm sorry, Sasuke. I hurt you. I can understand if you're furious with me. I deserve it. Please feel free to seek retribution. I won't fight back. Sasuke stepped forward. Naruto pointed to his own chin and squeezed his eyes shut. He knew that being punched in the chin was nothing compared to what happened to Sasuke, but he hoped it would serve at least as the start to his penance. As Sasuke approached, however, there was no swing of a fist. Instead, it was the embrace of a friend. I forgive you, Naruto. These simple words brought tears to the boy's eyes. Sakura even felt herself getting swept up in the moment. Kakashi smiled as he witnessed his team slowly repairing itself, healing back together again. And so they began to train. Sasuke was having a hard time keeping up, however. Itachi had been told to stay close just in case someone made an attempt on their lives. Kakashi kept commanding them to train with their tailed beast modes. Since version 2 was out of the question for Naruto, he decided to focus on version 1. Sasuke could still access version 2, but his previous injuries made it difficult. He would strain to enter it. Within his head, he spoke. Matatabi, more power, I gotta grow faster. The beast shook its head. In your condition, going too much further could kill you. More power, Matatabi. Itachi watched from a distance as Sasuke entered version 2, but almost as soon as he had, the form ended. Sasuke hit the ground, coughing up blood. Itachi rushed to his side and helped him. Don't strain yourself. Your lungs are different now. Your stamina won't be the same as it used to be. Trust me. Sasuke spat the remaining bloody mucus from his mouth. I guess you and me are more alike than we thought. He smiled, his teeth pink with blood. Itachi nodded. Two different issues, the exact same symptoms. It's like looking into a mirror. Meanwhile, Sakura was sitting there. Kakashi would walk to her. Call on Isobu. She shook her head. He won't come out. Kakashi was confused. Why? She looked up. When Sasuke got hurt and Naruto lost himself, me and Isobu had a fight. We haven't talked since I blew up on him. Kakashi knelt down. Then go make friends with him. She shook her head. I said some pretty rotten stuff. I was pretty mean to him, and I told him not to come to me anymore if he was just going to hold me back. Kakashi put a hand on her shoulder. Do you think you and Isobu are friends, Sakura? Were you friends before this? She nodded. Best friends, I thought. Kakashi offered a reassuring smile. Even the best of friends have a spat. The fact that we can bear our emotions in full force towards them is proof of how much we trust them. That even if we're hurtful, we feel safe expressing ourselves. Now, go make up. Sakura nodded. Entering her subconscious, she came to where Isobu was. He sat there, face turned around in shame. Iso? He didn't respond. Sobi, she called again. He kept his back turned towards her and hid his face. But suddenly, he felt two warm hands on his face. His eye opened and he looked down to see Sakura with a concerned look. He gently tried to pull away, but she wouldn't let him. Are you okay, Sobi? I'm sorry, he said. It was as if he'd been waiting days to say it. Sakura let off a soft and melancholic smile before it returned to concern. No, I'm sorry. I was so mean to you. I just wanted to help my friends, to protect them. But I shouldn't have gotten so mad at you. You were just trying to protect me. It was wrong to be so callous. I know you lost a good friend in the past, and I didn't act with proper feelings towards that. The big beast tried to speak, with tears rolling down its cheeks. I was overprotective. I just couldn't bear to lose someone I love again. It hurt so bad. I still haven't healed from that. And if you were taken from me too, I wouldn't want to live anymore. I would probably just burnt out all my chakra till I was dissipated forever. Sakura leaned forward and kissed the beast's chin. You're such an innocent soul. Even if I die, Isobu, I'll be with you forever. I promise. Even if I have to bind all of my chakra to yours, I'll never leave you. This was their training. This was Isobu and Sakura's training for the time. Isobu, for as big as he was, required a lot of emotional maintenance, and time could be spared to help the big lug cope. Naruto, on the other hand, found himself in the opposite direction. He was standing before the cage and arguing with the Ninetales. You bastard! You're a murderer! A killer! You killed your own brother and sister just because they're protecting a village! Naruto shouted. Don't feign to know me, you lowly piece of trash! Kurama shouted back. I am a god, a force of nature. You cannot keep me bound in a body like this. One day, I will escape again. And when I do, I'll kill you and I'll kill everything and everyone you love. And I'll do it just to see you suffer in agony and torment. For no other reason than because I can. I will never serve you. Kakashi stood there watching the scene. Sasuke was sitting under a tree with Itachi, taking a break and recovering. Sasuke almost looked like he might fall asleep in his big brother's embrace. Sakura was shedding tears through a smile and Naruto was shedding his through a scowl. Jiraiya would eventually return to them. Tsunade installed as the next Hokage. How's training coming? Kakashi shrugged. 
Sakura may have to be our new spearhead. Naruto can't control his beast, and Sasuke's just not strong enough to exert himself anymore. Jiraiya sighed. Well, we get what we get, and we don't get upset. That's something I try to live by. We just need to focus on what we can do, so let's do our best. They would continue to train, learning new techniques outside of their Jinchuriki training, and would grow stronger by themselves. However, it becomes obvious that Naruto is not going to be making any progress into his training with the Ninetales. They were unsure of what to do. That's what Sasuke and Matatabi were talking about while speaking with each other. Or at least, that's what it evolved to. We have a big responsibility on our hands. At any time, Suna could launch its retaliatory attack on us, and the entire world would be watching. If we can't defend Konoha, then it's gonna be World War IV. You have my undying support, Matatabi told Sasuke, hoping to ease his stress. This didn't help him much. I don't question that, Matatabi. It has to do with me, though. With Naruto. I'm not strong enough to be your Jinchuriki. I can't sustain version 2 without hurting myself. And Naruto can barely use version 1 without losing control. I don't know what to do. Matatabi thought about it for a time. When I was in Kumo, I recall my Jinchuriki and Gyuki's Jinchuriki at the time visiting an island. At the time, I and Gyuki were rather hostile towards our vessels. But after training there, our Jinchuriki didn't even require our permission or cooperation to make use of our power. Maybe Naruto could benefit from that. Sasuke thought about it and told Kakashi. Letting Matatabi talk through him, Kakashi and the Beast discussed. Where is this place? Kakashi asked. Matatabi seemed to have an issue answering that question. You see, that's the issue. I'm not entirely sure. Elaborate, Kakashi demanded. Matatabi would go on to say that the place they were looking for was an island in the Land of Lightning, and it wasn't even actually an island, but a massive turtle whose back was essentially an entire ecosystem. It didn't stay in one place, but it did have a general area where it liked to inhabit. The issue was that it was under Kumo's control, and simply going there without permission would be an act of war. Kakashi would then discuss this with Tsunade. Well, it'll be war anyway. If Matatabi says this is a safe place for Naruto to train and control the Ninetales, then we should try. Do your best not to be detected. Kakashi would then prepare to leave with his team, as well as Itachi, who was there to support Sasuke. They would take a boat out to sea and head toward the Land of Lightning. This trip was rather long, though Sakura seemed to be having the time of her life. Her connection to Isobu caused her to develop a deep love for the sea. Naruto, on the other hand, was busy puking over the side of the ship. Sasuke was neutral. The salt air was doing him good. Unbeknownst to them, as they left, Konoha was slowly being surrounded by Suna Shinobi, ready to finish the job. As Team 7 sailed along, they would eventually see the island not too far off, but they couldn't just sail up to it lest they be detected. So instead, they called upon Isobu, who would appear from Sakura in the water below them. They would climb onto him, and much to everyone save Sakura's chagrin, they'd have to step into his mouth. It was either that or drown, so they did as they were told. Closing his mouth, they sank down below the waves like a submarine, and began making their way to the island without anyone knowing. Isobu would sneak up and bring his head above the water and help Team 7 on. They would climb out of his mouth and onto the turtle's shell. Sakura would return Isobu within her, and the squad of five would make their way through the brush in the direction that Matatabi threw Sasuke was leading them. They would come to a waterfall and Sasuke would point to it. Matatabi says that this is the waterfall of truth. It's meant to test the hearts of all who enter to see if they're true. If they are, the path will open. But Naruto will have to face his own inner demons if he wants to pass. Naruto heartily agrees to it, knowing that there is no other choice and he'll do it without fail. He sits down and begins to meditate. As he does, he's met with his dark doppelganger, a creature with Naruto's face but eyes full of malice. At first, Naruto tries to fight, but he hears the voice of Matatabi from far away telling him that he must defeat the darkness in another way. The darkness speaks. What are you doing here? Trying to train? Trying to control the Nine Tails? We saw how well that went before, didn't we? Naruto shakes his head. No, I wasn't prepared. The darkness scoffs. And you're ready now. What's changed? Are you so sure you'll be able to do it this time? Or will you lose control again and hurt your friends? Maybe you'll even succeed in killing them this time. Naruto once more shakes his head. My friends are stronger now than they were then. The darkness stares into his eyes, as if asking him if anyone could truly believe what he was saying. Stronger? Sakura isn't sure she can even get Isoba to fight, and Sasuke can't even sneeze without needing a nap. You think either of them will be able to help you? Let's not kid ourselves. You failed once and you'll fail again, and this time you'll actually kill Sasuke. Naruto looked down, thinking about what he had done, how he had hurt Sasuke so badly. The darkness approached him. Yes, yes, remember that pain. That's the cost of failure. 
Sasuke will die, Sakura will die, Itachi, Kakashi, and everyone in the Hidden Leaf will perish because of your failures. Naruto felt his emotions getting the better of him, but then he heard a voice. Two voices. Naruto, it's okay. None of what happened is your fault. Yes, you had a misstep, but that's life. Nobody ever said it would be easy. You can't be perfect, and there's no path forward through life where you never hurt anyone. Accidents happen, and you need to know that this is okay. In reality, they had noticed that Naruto had started crying, the weight of his inner demons dragging him down. But this wasn't something ignored. Sasuke and Sakura knew exactly what this meant, so they stepped over to him and knelt down beside him to let him know that they were there and they cared about him. I've already forgiven you, Naruto, Sasuke said. Now I need you to forgive yourself. Sakura wrapped her arms around Naruto from the side. You're so strong, Naruto. Don't start doubting yourself now. Win or lose, success or failure, we do it together. The only way you can truly fail is if you don't even try. Don't let the doubt win. Push it away and choose to try. Within his subconscious, the shades of Sakura and Sasuke appeared beside him and began to hug their friend. Naruto felt their love and smiled, taking a deep, calming breath. As he opened his eyes, the dark Naruto was gone and the path forward opened. The trio stood up and entered the cave. They looked around at all the carvings. One showed a strange octopus-bull hybrid. Sasuke spoke. Gyuki, that's what Matatabi called it. She says it's the Eight Tails. They moved further and found another mural, this time depicting a cat. And this is Matatabi herself. This here marks the entrance to the chamber. Sasuke opened the door. As they went to enter, Sasuke stopped both his brother and Kakashi. Only Jinchuriki are permitted to access this room. Kakashi stopped for a moment and then spoke. No, I can't let you go alone. If something happens, I need to be there to stop it. Sasuke offered a reassuring smile. It's okay, Sensei. You need to let us go. Let us fend for ourselves. We'll come back, I promise. Kakashi looked down. You better. Itachi offered Sasuke a reassuring smile. I believe in you. In all of you. I'll wait here patiently until you return. Sasuke smiled and stepped in, the door closing behind them. Inside, Naruto looked around. So, what now? Sasuke sat down beside Naruto and Sakura, beckoning them to follow. You need to enter your subconscious and open the gate. Let Kurama out, and then force him to give up all of his chakra to you. Then you need to put a new seal on him. Are you going to be able to do this? Naruto looked down. I'm not sure. And if I let him out again and fail, he'll kill you guys. Sasuke shook his head. No, you won't fight alone. We'll be there too, just focus on taking his chakra. You have to want it more than him. And remember, we'll be with you every step of the way. Naruto nodded and closed his eyes. Upon closing them, he was inside the same room where he always found Kurama. But this time, by his side were Sasuke and Sakura. Sakura was obviously disturbed by looking into the cage and the eyes within it, but Sasuke maintained his cool and even offered Naruto a smile. Just rip the tag off and undo the lock. We're with you. Naruto stepped up to the gate. Kurama looked down upon him. Have you come to beg for more chakra? Or perhaps you've come to let me finish the job? Naruto took a deep breath, looking back at his friends. No, I've come to subjugate you, he said, his attention returned to the beast. Kurama let out a laugh that shook the walls and caused the water reflecting from the ground to ripple and grow choppy. Please, open the gate and try. I'm begging you. I must see you try this. It'll be the funniest thing to happen to me in the last millennium. Naruto reached up for the tag and ripped it away. There was the lock. He looked as Kurama's grin widened. Naruto lifted his shirt and held it in his teeth as he pulled back the sleeve on his right arm. The seal appeared on his stomach, the swirl that resembled his namesake. On his hand, another swirl appeared as a formula was written down his forearm. He took a deep breath through the nose and then pressed his hand to his stomach, giving a quick twist. The lock began to open. Once it had been completely removed, Kurama's pupils narrowed and the door shot open with such speed that it knocked Naruto back. Kurama came out with such force and passion that a feral bark could be heard, as if he were no more than a wild animal. For the first time, Naruto, Sakura, and Sasuke witnessed the true power and size of Kurama. Naruto shuddered at the beast. Guys, we can't beat it. Sasuke turned Naruto around and slapped him. If you give up now, everyone dies. Fight to the death. Take his chakra or die. Those are your only options now. Go down fighting or know that you did nothing to stop people from dying. Naruto rubbed his face. You're right, you're right. He slapped his cheeks a couple more times to hype himself up. I can do this. He turned to face Kurama as both Sasuke and Sakura put their hands on his shoulder. He turned to look at Sakura who spoke. No, we can do this. Naruto smiled and nodded. He rushed forward as Sakura and Sasuke summoned Matatabi and Isobu within Naruto's subconscious. Together, the beasts and their Jinchuriki faced Kurama again. Its power was great, but their conviction granted them new strength. 
broken limits that were reset higher and stronger than before. As Kurama charged a tailed beast ball, they responded by firing back their own, which caused Kurama's to pop in his face like a balloon. It knocked Kurama back. Naruto rushed over to his tail and began trying to pull the chakra out of it. It was a hard job, and he wasn't making much progress. Kurama then stood and whipped his tail, sending Naruto flying. He was caught by Isobu. Are you okay, little fella? Isobu asked. Naruto responded with a ring gesture. You'll just have to try something else. Don't you have any sealing techniques? Matatabi asked. Naruto shrugged. I don't know. Matatabi looked at him for a moment. You're an Uzumaki for heaven's sake. You have to have at least one. Figure it out. Naruto would form a Rasengan and Isobu would then supercharge it with his own chakra. He then flung Naruto at Kurama who would then proceed to be smashed with a three tails big ball Rasengan. Kurama would go rolling back as would Naruto. He would then weave hand gestures. Suddenly, Tori Gates would come down from above and hold Kurama down so he couldn't move. Naruto thought for a second. I'm not sure what to do now. Matatabi looked down with a startled expression. What? Figure it out, we're gonna die! Naruto thought about it for a second and then felt two hands wrap around him from behind. He turned back to see a strange red-haired woman there. Despite how close she was at the moment, she didn't feel threatening. Her smile was warm. She kissed his cheek and suddenly from Naruto's back shot adamantine chains. These chains would grip the Ninetales chakra and begin to pull. The woman spoke in his ear. You want this more. Show him how much you want it. He desires to keep his chakra for himself. You want it for your friends, for your village. Don't take no for an answer. Naruto let out a battle cry and the chains pulled harder. Suddenly, he ripped the chakra from Kurama's body and pulled it into himself. His body was suddenly set alight with golden chakra and he felt his power increase even further. He would look up and push Kurama back into the cage and seal it again. Suddenly, the three of them awakened in the chamber and saw Naruto glowing golden. The three of them cheered and celebrated together, but as soon as they stood, Matatabi spoke. Be careful with how you use that power. Now that this new border has been crossed, when you take chakra from Kurama, realize he'll take some from you too. Overuse of this will result in your death, so please be careful. Naruto would nod and the three would exit the room. There, they planned to tell Kakashi the good news, but before they could, they realized that he was upset. What is it? Naruto asked. Kakashi spoke. I just received word from Tsunade. Konoha is currently under attack by Suna. This is the moment we've been waiting for. Sasuke would curse. There's no way we can make it back in time. Sakura looked to him. I actually think we can. The group looked to her. Uh, Isobu just told me he can use space-time ninjutsu, and uh, he says he can get us back ASAP. Kakashi's eyes widened. Why didn't he tell us sooner? Sakura let off a nervous smile. He says it never came up? Kakashi shook his head. Just use it now. Sakura nodded and put her hands together. With the blink of an eye, they were gone. They rematerialized at the place where Isobu was most comfortable, his temple that had been built for him in Konoha. They rushed outside and saw the devastation, heard the crying and saw the explosions. Itachi looked around. I've got to regroup with the Anbu. Kakashi nodded. He then looked to his squad. Listen, I've got to go check on Tsunade. I need the three of you to go down there. Use whatever new strength you've found to subdue the enemy. Assert your dominance. Show the world that the leaf isn't some frail village. The trio offered an agreement in unison. Kakashi would run off. Naruto looked back. It's now or never. Sakura entered her version 2 cloak and began to make her way down into the fray. Sasuke stood there. I don't know how much help I'll be able to give, but I'll do my best. Naruto put his hand on Sasuke's shoulder. That's all I'm asking for. Let's show the world what deterrence looks like. Naruto turned around, still in his chakra cloak, and made his way off. Within Sasuke's head, he heard Matatabi. Unlock my seal. If you do, I'll use my chakra from myself instead of channeling it through you. It'll help me take on my true form without dragging you down. Sasuke, trusting his beast, agreed, unlocking the seal. This allowed Matatabi to take true form without channeling it through Sasuke, yet at the same time keeping enough chakra within him to keep him alive. However, the appearance of Matatabi was viewed by the current Kazakage as a calling card. Gara, in his infinite insanity, decided to let Shukaku out. None would dare stand against Suna and live. The massive beast would begin to rampage through the village, but Matatabi ignored it, choosing to aid the left flank where they were weakest. Sakura kept it to the right flank, and Naruto charged right up the middle. It was he who saw Shukaku's appearance and knew that he had to do something about it. He rushed up through the enemies, shredding them as he went along until he stopped at the center. Gara! He called out. The beast looked down. Oh, look how the mighty has fallen, he cried. Kurama, unable to take command, a prisoner to a human child, a slave indeed. I may also be sealed, but the question here is if it is I who's the prisoner, or my Jinchuriki. Naruto heard this and thought about it. He took more of Kurama's chakra and formed it into a tailed beast itself. 
a massive golden fox appearing before them, he began to attack the beast. As Kurama and Shukaku fought, it was obvious that Naruto, despite the power of his beast, was not capable of keeping up with Shukaku, who knew how to use his powers better. Shukaku would be capable of knocking Kurama back, causing him to roll across the ground. He raised himself up to his feet. Before he could do anything, Shukaku was on top of him again, its sand covering Kurama, threatening to drown the beast. Truly a shame, Shukaku shouted. You're but a shell of your former self, Kurama. Your power has dwindled. Perhaps the greatest mercy I can show you is kill you in hopes that you'll regenerate into the true warrior you used to be. The sand began to close in tighter, attempting to crush the beast. But Naruto saw it. He saw Gara sticking up out of the center. Naruto wormed his way up through the sand. Naruto spoke. Gara isn't your prisoner. Not anymore. You're done. Suddenly, Kurama's head pushed out and bit the face of Shukaku. Kurama's mouth was filled with sand, but the most important thing was that he managed to pull out Gara. This caused Shukaku's body to fall to nothing. Naruto forced Kurama to open its mouth and free Gara. Gara opened his eyes, startled at what he was seeing. Naruto looked down at him. Call off the attack, Gara, now! Gara jumped at the sound of Naruto's voice. He barely needed to say anything though. His people were already retreating from Konoha's forces, and with that, the battle came to an end and Konoha was defended. Gara was captured, and it was revealed that the seal Gara had over Shukaku was weak, which is partly what led to his insanity. They would apply a new seal, and for the first time in years, Gara was capable of sleeping through the night. Suna's forces were further demolished, and this led to Suna eventually failing as a village and being abandoned altogether. However, this battle served as a reminder to the world that Konoha still had its beasts, and they were not a force to be trifled with. And with Isobu's teleportation, it became spread far and wide that Konoha now had the means for an instant strike anywhere in the world, which led to paranoia and, once more, an age of peaceful deterrence. Due to this, peace was restored. Sasuke continued to have issues with his lungs from that point on, but Matatabi was always there to help him. And Sakura and Isobu ended up becoming the ideal specimens for what a Jinchuriki should be. And while Naruto didn't have any real relationship with Kurama, his control over the tailed beast allowed him to take the top spot as strongest Jinchuriki. It was fear of his ever-growing potential that helped keep the other villages in line. And that's the end of the story. I mean, it doesn't have to be. If this video is viewed enough, maybe I'll make another part. But as for me, I consider this story wrapped up for now. Be sure you leave a comment and tell me what your favorite parts were, or tell me what you think should have been changed. Until next time, peace out. Did you enjoy our video? Well, then be sure to check out these other great videos from the Amagi, and make sure to subscribe and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos.